Welcome into the two and two Cleveland Browns report. And oh boy, do some Browns fans think the world is on fire after this game? And I understand losing 28 to three is never a good thing. But the Browns are two and two going into the bye, which if I told you that before the season, you'd probably be on board with that. If I also mentioned Nick Chubb and Jack Conk would be gone for the year and they'd be two and two. You would definitely take that. That'd be one of those situations where you go, thank you, Mr. Banker, deal. So we're going to run through some injury news, and then we're going to talk about Kevin Stefanski and his offense and whatnot after that butt schlacking against the Baltimore Ravens. Let's start with Miles Garrett, though. So he briefly left the game with a left foot injury, and then he was seen leaving the stadium in a walking boot on that left foot. Now, when he spoke to the media in the press conference after the game, he had a signature Miles Garrett smirk slash chuckle when he was asked, hey, are you going to be able to go for the 49ers game two weeks from now after the bye? And he was like, of course I'm going to play against the 49ers. So Miles Garrett is off to another phenomenal start, five and a half sacks through four weeks. He is definitely in contention for the NFL Defensive Player of the Year award. And if he continues to put up numbers like these, and as long as, I mean, as long as Khalil Mack does not have six sack performances every single Sunday, Garrett's definitely going to be top three in the voting. Now, other injury news here to get to before we talk about Deshaun Watson. Ethan Posick, he left the game with a chest injury initially, then he came back, and then he left again with an ankle injury, and Kevin Stefanski said Posick is day-to-day. So another good timing for the bye week coming in with Garrett in a walking boot, Posick not feeling 100%. And now Deshaun Watson. Let's talk about Watson for a moment. Because this story kind of got turned on its head today. Watson was medically clear to play, according to Kevin Stefanski, who did a Zoom conference with the local reporters in Cleveland. But Watson opted not to play after doing a brief like 15, 20-minute workout on the field. Now, Kevin Stefanski did say, did say that Watson is expected to return after the bye he also said nothing is torn or separated and structurally Watson is okay this is not even a pain tolerance thing actually so a couple of quick thoughts I have on the entire Deshaun Watson injury saga if you will first off stop you know who you are stop because there are one too many people on the internet who are crying about Deshaun Watson being paid 230 million dollars and not playing on Sunday with a shoulder injury When we all, and I mean all, unless you are a newborn watching right now, watch the 2021 Brown season go down the drain because Baker Mayfield, and power to him for being a tough guy, played through a shoulder injury, and this team was worse because of it. I think we can all agree that if the Browns could go back in time, they would shut Baker down, not have him play against the Cardinals that one week, and just roll with Case Keenum the rest of the way. They probably would have been better off that way. So, for whatever reason, there are some people out there who were really happy when Baker Mayfield played through a shoulder injury and the Browns sucked, but they're also super upset that Deshaun Watson is not playing through a shoulder injury. Did Do you guys not remember just two years ago what happened when your quarterback plays through a throwing arm shoulder injury? It's not a good result. So now you're upset when Deshaun Watson's not playing through a throwing arm shoulder injury? The math ain't math in here, right? You can't have it both ways. You can't praise Baker for being a tough guy, but ultimately it was not a good decision because the Browns were cheeks where they injured Baker at quarterback, but then be harsh and critical on Deshaun Watson for doing what's best for this team and himself long-term by taking a week off before the bye when he went through a pregame warm-up and routine and was like, I can't throw the ball more than 10 yards right now. So this is not about Watson being paid $230 million. He has to suit up and play. If you can't play, you can't play. Now, I did find it a bit strange that Kevin Stefanski said it was Deshaun Watson's choice. The team medically cleared him. To me, that's just not a good move by your head coach. That's kind of putting the quarterback on the hot seat, right? You're more or less saying, hey, we wanted him to play. We cleared him to play. He chose not to play. Well, now you're throwing him under the bus. And they didn't do that back in 2021 with Baker, right? They said it was a team choice. Everything was a team decision. This time it wasn't a team decision. Now, Kevin Stefanski would go on, you know, throughout multiple interviews say, hey, I trust Deshaun. Deshaun Watson knows his body. But I don't know why he had to add that little extra bit of juice and drama 
and you know put that in front of the media saying, well, Watson did have the choice to play because we cleared him and he chose not to play. When you know that's just going to get people riled up online. But whatever. I'm not going to read too much into it. It's a week four throwing arm injury. Everything's going to be okay. Stefanski, after the game, when he was speaking to the media, he did have mention this, by the way, on Deshaun Watson. He was hopeful that he'd feel good today. He didn't. He knows his body. I trust him. He tried like crazy to make it. It's not a pain tolerance thing. As everybody knows, his history speaks for itself. In terms of that, he just didn't feel like he could operate at enough of a level to play for us today. Now, before we talk more about this in just a brief moment, I got to tell you guys about today's sponsor, Game Time. You shouldn't have to worry about when you're buying tickets to your next big event. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater events near you. If you're trying to catch an upcoming Browns game, or if you want to see a concert or another sporting event in your area, Game Time is the place to visit first. What I love about Game Time specifically is the ability to get last-minute tickets for the lowest price. There's nothing better than a spur-of-the-moment boys trip to a game, and with Game Time, you can do that without breaking the bank. Game Time is the only ticketing app that gives you complete peace of mind with your purchase. Buy tickets in seconds with two taps. They're obsessed with finding ways to help you save money on tickets. Game Time has deals on tickets right up to the start of the event and even an hour after it starts. It's the place to find last-minute seats. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code BROWNSCHAT for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply, but once again, download the Game Time app and redeem the code BROWNSCHAT for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, so let's kind of wrap up the whole Watson injury saga here. I don't think there's much cause for concern about this being a long-term injury for Watson. It is a bit strange and peculiar that on Friday in his locker room, Watson said, I'll play, and then fast forward to Sunday morning, 48 hours later, and he can't play. Like, did he just assume come Sunday that his shoulder would feel better? Did it something? Did it get worse between Friday and Sunday? Like, if the game was on Friday, would he have been able to go? If the answer is no, was that because he assumed come Sunday my shoulder would be feeling much better and it just wasn't feeling much better? Or is this a very slow pain issue or a slow uh, painstaking process of the shoulder just not bouncing back? I don't know. I I'm not a doctor. You're not a doctor. And I also want to add, I've never been hit by a defensive end, and chances are you have never been hit by a defensive end. So I'm not going to stand here and criticize Deshaun Watson for not playing after he was medically cleared. If he can't throw a football, then he can't throw a football and he can't be in the game. Sure, if it's a playoff game, different circumstance, but it's not. It's week four. You're going into the bye. That definitely changes things knowing, hey, if we can get through this week without me, we have next week off and I'll be much better for a very pivotal game against the 49ers at home when you start a long road trip after that. So, it's a bit bizarre that he goes from I'll play to not being able to play. It's a little bit weird that Kevin Stefanski is bringing up to the public spotlight that the team cleared him and Watson opted not to play, allowing the fans to run just completely rampant across the internet, going off about Watson having an opportunity to play, but himself choosing not to play, not the team shutting himself down. But it's week four. The Browns are two and two. Watson should be ready to go for week six against the 49ers. And if they win that game, no one's even going to be thinking about this at all. But what's your concern level over Deshaun Watson right now, injury-wise? Scale 1 to 10. I was at a 0 last Tuesday and Wednesday because he was limited with a, th with a shoulder injury. Everyone assumed he'd be ready to roll by Sunday, and he wasn't. So because of that, I went from a 0 or a 1 up to a 3, right? I'm only at a 3 out of 10. That's pretty low in my opinion. I definitely think it's a bit strange how he goes from I'll play to not being able to play. I also think it's even stranger of the comments Stefanski made today. But yesterday he said, I trust him, you know, and it seems like they are on the same page. They said they're on the same page. It's just a bit weird to let the public in on it was Watson's decision to play and he didn't play knowing people are going to start pointing fingers at him for the loss. That's not a very uh, kind move by your head coach to throw the QB under the bus more or less as a result. Now, 
Another reason why um, a little bit nervous, though, Dorian Thompson Robinson is not ready to start in the NFL. I know he was awesome in the preseason, and you know who you are. You wanted him to start after the Browns' first two games and Watson not looking super smart or super sharp. No, DTR should not be playing anytime soon. Like, sure, the play calling for DTR was not perfect, and Kevin Stefanski has gotten a lot of heat for that. But the score, and the score reflects that, but ultimately the execution was bad. Like, everyone wants to point at Kevin Stefanski for his play calling, okay? Was Kevin Stefanski the one that ran backwards 20 yards after entering the red zone? No, that was Elijah Moore. Was Kevin Stefanski the one with a forward lateral beyond the line of scrimmage for a loss of down and five-yard penalty? No, that was Dorian Thompson-Robinson. Was Kevin Stefanski the one failing to get more than three yards a carry? No, that was Jerome Ford and Kareem Hunt. So sure, there are a lot of things you can blame on Stefanski. Right, whether it's the Harrison Bryant QB sneak or a QB sneak, well, the QB sneak, but also just the trickery play of you know pitching into the quarterback and doing reverses and jet sweeps on third and one. Sure, you can get mad at him all you want for that, but ultimately, Stefanski's not the one out there with poor execution on these plays and costing this team several negative yards because they're running backwards or they're flipping the ball forward. So. I don't think it's fair to go, that's 110% on Kevin Stefanski. I, I don't subscribe to that thought at all. But let me know, should Stefanski give up play calling? This has been a very popular conversation and question within Browns fans for quite some time. And I maintain the belief of, I think Kevin Stefanski is the best play caller on this roster, on the sideline. Are there better play callers in the NFL? Absolutely. I have no reason to believe, and you have no real reason to believe, that Alex Van Pelt is any better of a play caller because what data points do we have to go look at to believe that? So for that reason, I'm going to continue to stick with Kevin Stefanski. He is trying to figure out this ground game without Nick Chubb. It's not easy to just run up the middle on third and one with Jerome Ford or Kareem Hunt when they're averaging two yards a carry and the defense knows a run is coming and it's probably going to be stopped at the line of scrimmage. you got to get creative sometimes. Kevin Stefanski's probably a victim of overthinking it at times and getting too cutesy. But when you got your backup QB in, you're trying to get creative, right? You're trying to help the quarterback out by picking up chunks of yardage elsewhere. And I think that's all he was a victim of on Sunday. At the end of the day, the Browns are 2-2. Two and two. Everywhere, the Browns are 2-2 two and two going into the bye. They are without Nick Chubb and Jack Conklin. Like I said earlier, if I told you back in August, Hey, the Browns are going to be 500 going into the bye. They played four pretty good teams. I mean, the Bengals, AFC champs or AFC runner-ups, the Ravens, a playoff team, the Steelers, the Steelers, and the Tennessee Titans. You would probably be okay with two and two. I think we'd all would have preferred three and one, and three and one would have definitely been attainable if they don't, you know, piss down their leg against Pittsburgh and they have Deshaun Watson playing against the Ravens, but they didn't have those two things go their way. And still, the Browns are two and two and they had a dominant victory over the Tennessee Titans. And did you see what the Titans did the very next week against the Bengals? The Titans are not some FCS team. That's a good team that Tennessee, that Cleveland, excuse me, just punched in the mouth over a week ago. All right, moving on here. We are on to week six. This is Monday, so it's the last day to kind of dwell on Sunday. We're moving on. We're talking about the 49ers. We're getting ready for the 49ers because the Browns' ground game has to improve before this matchup against San Francisco. Look at the numbers over the last three weeks. Week two, when they had Nick Chubb for a quarter and change, 198 rushing yards, 5.7 yards a carry. Compare that to weeks three and four, where they averaged 2.5 yards a carry, 3.7 yards a carry as a team. And they never get over 100 yards in either game. Jerome Ford and Kareem Hunt, unfortunately, they are not looking like pieces that are going to fill in for Nick Chubb at even 90% or 80% as to what Chubb could offer. That's why when the Browns signed Kareem Hunt, sure, the nostalgia in me was excited about that, and I was fired up that he wore Nick Chubb's T-shirt jersey to the first game. You knew he was going to run hard and play hard for Chubb, and that's still going to be true. But that does not change the fact that Kareem Hunt came off a season where he had a career low in rushing and receiving average, and the guy we saw run last year, it looks like that same guy is running this year. It's only been two games, so it's a little early, and I'm definitely overreacting, but also... Look at the numbers over the last two weeks. This ground game has to get improved. It has to be solved. It has to be figured out. The 49ers, unfortunately, are probably the worst team to face 
if you're trying to salvage and turn your ground game around, right? They've got Javon Hargrave. They've got Bosa. They've got Armstead. They've got Fred Warner. They have so many great – Dre Greenlaw. They've got so many great defenders, so many great run stoppers. So this is probably not the ideal matchup coming out of the bye. I'm sure they wish they were playing the Chicago Bears or maybe the Indianapolis Colts or just someone else – that does not have all those guys stopping the run, but they don't. So they have to do a lot of work over the bye, and they have to figure out a ground game moving forward without Nick Chubb. Because if they don't, and they come out of two weeks without Chubb, a bye, and the 49ers game, four weeks, three games, and they have no plan at running back moving forward and no plan at the rushing attack moving forward, that October 31st trade deadline could not get here any sooner because the Browns, are definitely going to be looking to pick up the phone and make some calls to try and improve their running back room. And who could they make some calls for? Jonathan Taylor. If they wait too long, if they give Chubb, excuse me, if they give Hunt and Ford, you know, one too many weeks, maybe Jonathan Taylor gets traded. Because after this upcoming Sunday, week four, Jonathan Taylor could play for any team in week five. And I'm sure there are some teams ready and eager to have them have him on their roster. Derrick Henry and Josh Jacobs, those are long shots, but if their teams uh, you know, spiral out of control before October 31st, maybe they could be attainable since they're all, or all three of these guys are on the last year of their respective contracts. If you don't want to pay a high price for a running back, there are some cheaper RBs out there. James Conner, I think that would be a great fit for Cleveland. He's been doing very well for the Cardinals. They are trying to tank, I think. He's on the last year of his contract, so it's not like he's going to be going back to the desert next season. That could be one to watch for. A lot of Browns fans have been asking for Cordero Patterson for months. He has been injured to start the year. He just played his first game in London this past Sunday, and he was hardly used as a running back. I think he just did kick returns. So I wouldn't hold your breath on CP84 coming in and saving the day. Michael Carter is definitely going to get traded. I mean, he is just riding the bench right now in New York behind Dalvin Cook and Brees Hall. So if the Browns think that there's another Elijah Moore in New York that just needs to go to a new city, to have his career resurrected, Michael Carter could be someone the Browns go out and trade for. But let me know, should the Browns trade for a running back? Type T for trade, type P for pass. Give me your honest opinion down below in the comment section as it comes to the Browns trading for a running back. All right, to kind of wrap up today's show, we're going to run through a quick housekeeping notes, if you will. But 28-3, to we're moving on. We're moving on. We're not going to think about this anymore. It's a loss. The Browns have to look at a lot of film over. Defensively, I have zero concern over the defense. They were going to come down to earth at some point. You knew that they could not hold opponents to just four to five first downs a game forever. Lamar Jackson, the Ravens, have a good offense. Yes, they were mis missing pieces on offense at left tackle and wide receiver and all that good stuff. But I'm not concerned over the defense. Anthony Walker talked about that speaking to the media today. They're going to be better from this. They're going to learn from it. And I'm a big believer in that as well. Now, some housekeeping notes like I was talking about. I just want to give some love right now to our Watch Party MVPs. If you've never tuned into a Watch Party, make sure you do so at some point this year. It's an absolute blast. Week one was Ray Bidding. Week two, the Green family all together. Tim Green, the second, the third, and the entire Green family. Week three was Sub-Zero. Week four, my guy Mike Dibble, who has been grinding in the chat. He got himself an MVP a nod in week four. Thank you guys so much for all of your support here at the Cleveland Browns Report. You have no idea how much it means to me. Now, our week four winner giveaway was a guy named Adam Gable. Adam, I've got your Browns turnover chain right here. It's just taking up room on my desk. So please, Adam, hit me up on Twitter or you can email me. We'll put that information at the bottom of the screen in just a moment. But our week two winner giveaway was Jeremy Stallman. Jeremy, I got your flag too right here. So Jeremy... Hit me up over on Twitter at Matthew Petey. If you're not on Twitter, you can email me at Matthew at chatsports.com. So please get in contact with me so I can mail these things out to you guys. It was your winnings, and I don't want to hold on to them for much longer. So please hit me up over on Twitter at Matthew Petey. You can email me, Matthew at chatsports.com. Jeremy and Adam, I want to get you guys your well-deserved winnings. So hopefully you'll get in contact with me otherwise. We might have to put them back on the market for another watch party. And I don't want to see you guys come in like two weeks late trying to claim it and someone else has now won it. That's not fun for anyone.